Have you ever wondered why do antennas radiate? We see antennas every day in our mobile devices, in base station and so on. But how do they work? Today we're gonna look into electromagnetic wave propagation, Maxwell's equations and experiments performed by Andre Marie Ampere and Michael Faraday. In the early 19th century, André-Marie Ampère was the first person to observe that negatively charged electrons move to positively charged protons inside a conductive material. Electric flux, on the other hand, occurs around a time-changing magnetic field. And we can think of a flux as something that penetrates through a surface. Both electric flux and electric current can create magnetic fields, but only electric flux can do it when stationary. And this is the conclusion of Ampere's circuit law. At the time of Michael Faraday, around 1831, it has already been observed that electric current produces magnetic fields, but the reverse was not known. So Michael Faraday came up with a bunch of experiments that showed that, first of all, a rotating magnet does indeed produce an electric field, and it has to rotate in order for it to do so. If, if the magnet remains stationary, no field, no electric field is produced. Faraday also observed that electric current passing through a conductor creates magnetic field at 90 degrees angle, which is really important for our understanding of Maxwell's equations. And he also created a pattern by placing iron fillings on a sheet of paper above a magnet. And it looks like this. Later on, it has been proven that this figure is actually not correct, because electromagnetic wave phenomena is a manifestation of the same thing according to quantum electrodynamics, but we're not gonna go into that yet. Back to 1931, Michael Faraday also observed that the voltage reading of electromagnetic force is increasing with the magnetic flux and is also proportional to the amount of turns in a loop. And this resulting EMF also increases if the time rate is changing. Moving on to Maxwell's equations. Although those equations rarely used on their own, they still provide the very basics of understanding of electromagnetic waves. But in order to understand them, we must review some fundamental mathematical concepts first. First, we must begin with vectors. And a vector is a quantity that has a direction and a magnitude. The length of a vector is proportional to the quantity's magnitude. And the direction is usually in either x, y or z. Vectors can create vector fields, which is three-dimensional representation of multiple vectors in a closed space. And when doing mathematical operations with vectors, we typically say things such as dot product and cross product. And the dot product is simply a measure of uh, how much vector A lies in the direction of vector B. And it's calculated as a magnitude of the vector A multiplied by magnitude of a vector B multiplied by cosine theta. And the next thing we need to discuss is the cross product. And the cross product, unlike the dot product, is all about the area and the vectors that are perpendicular to B and A. It's very easy to show the concept of cross product on the right hand. If I have a vector pointing this way and a vector pointing that way, basically left to me and one is pointing directly at you, then the cross product is going to be a vector pointing up. The other concept we need to understand is a concept of partial derivatives. And partial derivatives means that when something is changing but the other thing remains fixed, then we can draw a slope of the changing element. This function is going to be our partial derivative. Now in a 3D space we have three partial derivatives moving in x, 
Y and Z planes. So we have come up with something called the Del operator. And the Del operator is just a triangle, basically a mathematical concept that stands for it. It means partial derivatives of three dimensions. The Del operator is a sort of a 3D derivative. You can think of it that way. The first operation that is performed with Del operator is called gradient. And this function is used for converting scalar quantities into vector quantities. The gradient is basically the slope of a vector field. Then the next concept that we need to understand is divergence. To visualize divergence, imagine a vector field and at some points different vectors are going to point inwards where in other points vector fields are going to point outwards. So where the vector fields point inwards into a particular point this is where we say the vector field is diverging and when the vectors are pointing outwards and away from each other this is where we say the vector field is converging. Divergence is a scalar quantity, meaning that it has vector input and a scalar output. Finally, the last mathematical concept we need to review is the curl. And the curl is the measure of how much vector fields tend to circulate around each other. And imagine again the vector field and you will have some areas with divergence and those various in divergence, they can easily turn into a circulating vector fields like you will typically see a whirlpool on a river stream, for example, and this is basically similar. Using this stream analogy, you can think of it as a water going out or water going inward and uh, diverging or converging respectively. And it is defined as such. Basically, you have three partial derivatives. And this is just a simplified mathematical notation with a, an upside down triangle, basically it saves space on the drawings. And uh, then it's easy to see what are divergence and curl because divergence is a dot product of the del operator with the vector and a curl is a cross product of the del operator with a vector. So if we have a 3D vector field, you can have some vectors going that way, you can have some vectors going that way, uh, but in the middle you will have potentially vectors going this way. And so this is going to be our area of divergence, whereas Another area might look something like this. And this is going to be our area of convergence. And finally, if we have a situation like this, where different vectors come together and they start rotating, then we, this is our area of curl. And uh, this is essentially our vector field which we observe from distance. The curl of a gradient of a scalar field is always zero, meaning that in a scalar field we cannot have curl. And this can be summarized by this picture, which looks quite surrealistic. Also, the divergence of a curl of a vector field is always zero. So in a way, it, ten it tends to cancel each other.